Good day and happy Black History Month. Uh, my name is Ernest Disney Britton. I'm Vice President of Community Impact and Investment at the Arts Council of Indianapolis. And I have the incredible blessing and, and honor to work with all of the program partners and artists in putting together the annual Art and Soul at the Arts Garden Program. And as part of that process, I also have the opportunity of working with some amazing uh, artists and arts leaders, but also uh, some community leaders who have an incredible passion uh, for the arts. And we're having one of these conversations uh, today with uh, one of those, those local leaders, uh, the Reverend Winterborn Lupusel Harrison Jones. La Pucel. Uh, La Pucel, thank you. And so the Reverend is a scholar, an author, and a fifth generation minister. He's also senior pastor at the legendary <laughs> Witherspoon Presbyterian Church here in Indianapolis. Uh, and we're gonna spend the next uh, few minutes uh, sort of exploring art sure. and the black church, uh, the black church and the counter space, sort of, uh, uh, sort of the place of being a place of refuge, uh, shaping and affirmation as well. And also the intersectionality of the arts and spirituality within the black religious experience. Uh, also, uh, if we, as we have time, some on the arts and resistance and also uh, Witherspoon's unique legacy of arts, edu arts education and arts advocacy uh, in Indianapolis. And so uh, with that, uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome. Uh, to, be uh, here, to the Art and Soul at the Arts Garden. Thank yeah. you so much for being here. Thank and you. And thank you for providing this backdrop from well, the church, from I, the Kwanzaa ceremony. I, uh, like the Apostle Paul, I, I do not take credit for this. <laughs> But uh, we are honored to be a part of the uh, 2021 celebration um, and bring our Kwanzaa display, which is a part of our church's, uh, um, the life of our church, 365, to the Arts Garden. I think this is incredible. Uh, this, was, this was wonderful. And there's the libation ceremonies yes. that uh, we'll, we did today that will be a part of, of today's program. Um, as a nationally recognized uh, preacher and speaker on economic deprivation and religious bigotry, um, I mean, class inequity and racism, uh, that's a lot in and, and of lot. itself. Yeah. But what does that have to do with arts and culture? Mm -hmm. And how do you bring those together mm -hmm. as part of a, you being a pastor? Sure, so I would, I would say that, that all of those things are tied to the gospel. And when I say the gospel, I do not uh, isolate any particular religious tradition. Mm -hmm. But when you speak of wholeness and wellness and what it means to be fully human, what mm -hmm. it means to be an expression and a reflection of the divine and how we as men and women and women and men uh, here on earth are charged to create environments where every creature can thrive, then all of those things rest wonderfully together. We name them separately and sort of silo them off, I think, in a way that... Uh, makes them seem overwhelming. But uh, when I think of the gospel, I think of the gospel as something that binds us together mm. beyond and above every divide, every wall. And so arts becomes yet another way that we express the love and the joy, lament, suffering, and liberation of this uh, journey called life. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a perfect connection, yeah. how the gospel ties all of those things together. The gospel is the thing that holds us together. Well, can you tell, talk a little bit about the intersectionality, inter intersectionality of mm -hmm. arts and spirituality within the re black religious experience? And what I wanted to hear about also mm -hmm. is sort of your own personal mm -hmm. history in terms of that. Uh, a few months ago, we were talking uh, with a group of arts educators. Uh -huh. uh, this was actually pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and the discussion was about uh, where did we get introduced to the mm -hmm. arts? What is our own personal origin story in terms of uh, how our exposure mm -hmm. and how we developed a passion mm -hmm. for the arts? And so how did your black religious experience mm -hmm. with the arts as a kid growing up help shape your perspective today? That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let me start with the latter first. So I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C., and I am a fifth generation a minister. Mm -hmm. Men and women in my family have been light bearers for uh, over a century. But it started in the black church. Mm. The black church not so much as a separate uh, entity, but as an experience, as Dr. Thurman shapes sort of these words, the black religious experience. And how in those spaces, what I would call black sacred spaces, um, 
we are given opportunities to learn, to pray, to grow, to be shaped. And uh, the arts is a large part of how we understand uh, and express our devotion to God. Mm -hmm. So in Washington, D.C., my grandfather was pastor of the New Samaritan Baptist Church uh, for over 39 years, but it was nothing to hear anthems and hymns and strings and dance and movement. Those were ordinary things. You also talked about the stained glass windows. The stained well. glass, you remember yes. that, the stained glass <laughs> window. Uh, and so all of these things were a part of what it meant to worship and to be fully present in sacred space. But then also, uh, because Washington is what it is, uh, as a child, I remember roaming through the National Cathedral and roaming through the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception on the campus of Catholic University, the Rankin Chapel at Howard. And so sacred spaces and the innate artistic elements of them have always been a part of how I understand life, uh, what it means to um, worship. Um, and those opportunities, those living and learning opportunities within the black church uh, has shaped even my work with the Asante Art Institute and the work that we do at Witherspoon Presbyterian Church. So then there's another piece, a sort of broad piece, if I can sort of build a tapestry, of how African Americans uh, historically, um, the black church has always been the hub or the gathering place. Yeah. And so the idea of church as a place of worship uh, only doesn't necessarily sit well within the fullness of the black religious experience. The church was all things. So we learned and we rallied and we lamented and we uh, conversed, mm -hmm. uh, libraries and... and um, and we uh, socialized. All, all, of, yeah. so all of these things were yeah. in this one place. So why not arts? And so um, my first love for arts and for arts advocacy and the role of arts was birthright in the church. And are you an artist? <laughs> People ask me that all the time. <laughs> but then you see this and I say no. So my, um, uh, yes. And uh, as Mrs. Keisha Dixon, who's one of our members, would say, my gift is um, I'm a curator of experience, is what she calls Excellent. me. Excellent. And so I do staging and theater and transforming space. And so um, it is not enough to speak of the gospel, but how do we create settings where people can fully experience uh, the divine? This is a beautiful setting. Thank you. You, you came here, you delivered all of this to the Arts Unfortunately, I must say yes. And with you the, constructed this tableau With the here. help of many, uh, many, but even Al Kanara, Stephen Dixon, uh, commissioned uh, by the church, um, these things are on full display. You come during Lent. I mean, so no matter where or what time you engage with this film, arts have always been, I do not own this tradition, have always been at the center of well, the Witherspoon legacy. Well, and that is my big question of, uh, can, you per can you describe the church's culture uh, oh, at yes. Witherspoon Presbyterian uh, Church as it relates to arts and culture. And I'm also interested in how it was before you arrived uh -huh. and how is, how is it different now? Well, let me say this first, that I have inherited a great tradition, a great legacy. Mm -hmm. Witherspoon now sits at 5136 Michigan Road um, in a uh, edifice designed by a black architect. But mm -hmm. we once were on the edge of the avenue. And so when you talk about J.J. Johnson and uh, Russell Webster and Reverend Marvin Chandler and that hub of culture, all of those were Witherspoon members. Yeah. So there was nothing to have trombones and saxophones <laughs> and, and more culturally expressive ways of worship. Uh, Dr. Marietta Rose founded one of the first um, art, what I would call schools in the city, uh, that was run by local African-American artists, professors from IU, that we then named under the leadership of one of our uh, longest serving pastors, Dr. Landrum Shields, the Dr. Yeah. Marietta Rose Performing Arts Center, where ah. there was tap dance and calligraphy and African-American history and dance. Everything. So we have continued in that tradition today, whether it's Rob Dixon or Billy Myers or Keisha Dixon or the Asante Art Institute or Abada or Freetown Village. Arts have always been a part of who we are and how we connect our culture with our faith. There is no divide there. So whether it's stained glass mm -hmm. windows or hymns or anthems or dance or children or even the uh, Actors Inc. Uh, acting program at the church, for over a century, these sort of things have been a part of the DNA of Witherspoon. And so we live in that space. Um, and so with that comes art education, uh, art literacy, art appreciation, but also arts advocacy. We believe that any part of a thriving, I would say community of faith or community more broadly, must have opportunities for people to um, encounter the, the creative part of uh, our human essence. Well, I, I certainly am drawn to visit and I will visit uh, 
uh, one day soon. Invitation is always open. I, I do listen uh, occasionally uh, okay. on uh, Friday's afternoon. Yes. And one, one Sunday I was listening and I heard this voice of this teaching artist that I know yeah. uh, from the theater community uh -huh. and he was giving a prayer and I didn't know, I thought, I know that voice, mm -hmm. uh, so Josiah. Mm -hmm. yes. And so it sort of blew me away and I was thrilled to hear him as part of it. I have one, one final sure. question, but I want to thank you for thank you, joining thank us. You, thank and you. Uh, constructing uh, this as, as a part joy. of Art and Soul at Thank the you. Arts Garden. Uh, this one final question, uh, and I'm asking this, this question uh, for everyone that I'm talking with, with today. Um, there's been a lot of reflecting in the arts and cultural sector over the, uh, during the pandemic about issues of race and diversity and inclusion and access. But as board chair uh, of a black arts organization who is serving um, black uh, citizens and as an arts advocate. Over the next year, what are the three things that you would like to see happen in terms of change to ensure that there is a creative life, access to a creative life for all? Well, I think the first thing is funding. Uh, there are so many wonderful organizations that oftentimes do not uh, get opportunities to get to microphones and tables. So challenging those entities who govern those spaces mm -hmm. to look outside of themselves mm -hmm. uh, into community. Dr. Carla Matata would uh, uh, challenge or, or encourage me to call that uh, our community engaged participatory research to partner with community and to find those places where artists exist mm -hmm. and then to go there, or in the words of one author, to build a sidewalk where they are. That would be the first thing, like to, to open the table and continue to expand um, the, the, the roster, if you will, of um, how we affirm uh, diversity in the arts. The second thing I would say is to truly believe that arts are not an accessory to what it means to be a human, <laughs> but it is an essential part. Mm -hmm. And so whether that is in our schools or in our faith communities or in community centers, um, that uh, I believe, and I know you do as well, mm -hmm. that you cannot live a full life without arts. Right. Arts and right. culture and exposure and opportunities to um, be expanded and then to teach, mm -hmm. um, I think are essential. The third thing I would say, and I do not offer these certainly to suggest that they do not exist, but uh, I do offer them to say that this is where my heart is. The third thing that I would say that I would offer that I would like to see change or be expanded, if you will, is um, the, the sort of uh, Dr. King, let me contextualize it this way, says that we are all interconnected in a never ending tapestry and what affects one of us directly affects all of us indirectly. This piece about arts as a, um, as a, a, a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. I would love for the Indianapolis community to continue to rally around justice. Certainly after the uh, horrible events of the summer in the season of Pentecost, um, the response of the arts community was admirable in many ways. But art also captures a part of our history. And so finding ways to stand artistically uh, in the tension of the times unapologetically mm -hmm. and allow artists to do what they do best, which is to archive and to tell of struggle, triumph, and liberation. That might not be the clearest thing, but, but we tend to rally around trauma and pain <laughs> yeah. versus allowing these sort of things to be uh, a part of who we are. Everything cannot be Beethoven and Mozart. Everything cannot be the Nutcracker. Um, sometime, as Ashley Baskin just recorded, it has to be Cinnamon and it has to be Mississippi Goddamn, <laughs> and it has to speak of the true essence of what people are experiencing. Thank you. You're welcome. I know people are listening. Thank you, Reverend Winterborn, thank you. for being with us today. Um, thank you for being here at the Arts, Art, Arts Garden and at Art and Soul at the Arts Garden yeah. and being a part of this year's program. I want to thank everyone uh, for uh, listening to our conversation today, and there will be more. Uh, and let's continue with Art and Soul at the Arts Garden. Let's celebrate.